Hi everyone, it's Mickey and in this video we'll be extending the previous video of the inventory system to include crafting and recipes. If you haven't watched the previous video, you can find links to it and the source code and everything in the description below. Now as I've mentioned, we're going to be developing a recipe and crafting system. We'll need to be replacing the stats panel with our own recipes and allowing the player to craft those recipes as long as they have the required items in their inventory. The first thing that we want to do is check out the description below for a package called recipe sprites.yymps. These will be all the required sprites to get crafting and recipes started. Once you've downloaded the package, you can import the package by either going to the tools menu and selecting import local package, or you can just drag and drop the file into the editor. We're going to say yes to bring up the import window. And you can see we have a bunch of new sprites here. We'll click the add all button and then finally click the import button. If we look at the project now, you can see in the sprites folder, we have all the original sprites that we had and also the new ones that we just imported. Now we'll be developing this system using some of the same programming methods as the previous inventory system. So what that means is let's take a step back and talk about the inventory system we built previously. We already created the inventory system that contains a number of different functions. These functions are all stored within a struct to make it easier to import into our other projects. These functions can range from finding a specific item to adding or removing items from the inventory. When it comes to coding the recipe struct, we're going to be following the same principles as above. This means we're also going to need an array to hold all of our recipes. We're going to create a recipe find function that's going to return the index if the recipe exists. We'll also have a recipe add function that's going to take the name, the requirements, and the product, as well as the sprite to show on the UI. Now these requirements and products parameters are going to be arrays. This will be because we want to ensure that the recipes can create and accept one or more requirements and also produce one or more items. We'll also create a recipe has function that will accept a name. This function will return a Boolean value to tell us whether or not we have the requirements for that recipe. And if we have all those requirements for the recipe, our recipe craft function will actually go through and remove the requirements from our inventory and add any of the products that need to be added. Finally, to keep up with the standards of the inventory system, we're going to have a recipe get function that's just going to return the local array within our struct. Now that we have everything planned out, let's actually switch back to the editor and create a new script file. Let's call this script file recipe with a capital R. Now we also need to take this function and turn it into a struct so it can hold on to other functions and variables inside of it. This is very easy to do and all we need to do is add the keyword constructor to the end of it. Now I mentioned previously that we need to have access to the inventory system. In GameMaker, we can inherit other structs, meaning that we have access to all of the functions and variables within the struct. To do this, all we have to do is add a semicolon and then ask it to inherit the inventory struct. Once again, this means that we will have access to everything that we write here and everything that's already been previously written in the inventory struct. Now for the recipes, let's create a local array which will hold all of the recipes that we're gonna add. For the first function, let's create a recipe find function. For the parameter, we're going to pass in the name. This function needs to loop over our entire recipes array and compare the name that we passed in to the name that it finds. If we find the name of the recipe, then we can simply return the index. Returning the index here will break out of the for loop and it won't continue on. However, if we get to the very end of the for loop, we want to make sure we return a negative one to indicate that we did not find the recipe. Remember, arrays start at zero, so the negative one will be if we didn't find anything and we could just check for that in our code. Now let's move on to the recipe add function. This function will accept a name, the requirements, the products, and as well as a sprite to show on the user interface. We'll utilize the array push functionality within GameMaker to push into our new recipe array. We'll simply pass the array that we want to push into, and for what we are going to push into the array, let's create a struct. We'll fill this struct with the name of the recipe, 
and also the requirements. The products will also add, and finally the sprite to use in the user interface. Now with that function done, we can move on to the recipe has function. This is going to accept a name as a parameter. We will need to find the recipe by calling the recipe find function and passing in the name. Here, let's also create a new variable called cancraft and we'll set this to false. We'll use this to return true or false at the end of our function. Now let's check to ensure we found a recipe by checking the index. If it's bigger or equal to zero, this means that we found a recipe. On the next line, let's set cancraft to true. We're going to assume that everything is going to pass. Now let's set up a for loop to loop through all the requirements. We'll also hook into the item has function here. Remember, this function takes the name of the item in our inventory and the quantity that we want to check for, returning true or false. So we can select the recipe that we found using the index variable, and then into the requirements array and select the requirement using the requirement variable. Finally, what we want to do is pass in the name that is based on the struct. We'll copy and paste this and change the name to quantity that we want to test for. Finally, if the item has returns false, we can then set cancraft to false and break out of the for loop because no further checks will be required. And now we can return the cancraft variable that will tell us if we're able to craft that particular recipe or not. Moving on to the recipe craft function, this is going to be similar to the recipe has function. We'll pass in the name of the recipe that we want to craft. We will find the recipe using the recipe find function, and we'll check to see if we did indeed find the recipe itself by checking the index. We can also check to see if we have all the valid requirements by using the recipe has function. Once we know that we have everything that is needed, we can come up and we can copy the for loop that we created above and just paste it below. Again, this is just going to loop through all the requirements that we have. Now, instead of using the item has function, we can replace this with an item subtract. This is because we want to remove the items from our inventory. Remember that the item subtract function accepts the name of the inventory item that we want to remove and the quantity. Now let's finish by cleaning this up as we don't need this inside an if statement and we can remove the can craft variable and the break as well. Next, we're going to have to loop through the products and add them into the inventory. For our loop, we'll start at zero and go until we reach the length of the array for the products. We can get this by referencing the selected recipe with the index variable and then reference the product variable. Now we can call the item add and pass in the current product by accessing the current recipe and the current product by passing in the product index. And then finally, we'll reference the name. Let's copy and paste this because we also want to pass in the quantity that we want to create. And we'll add the sprite to be used to the item at the end. Now let's actually take one more look at this function because it is a lot to take in. First, we're going to cycle through all of the requirements, and for each of the requirements, we're going to subtract it from our inventory. We can call the inventory function because we inherited the inventory struct from above. We're passing in the name and the quantity to subtract from the inventory. For the products, we're doing the same thing except we're using the item add function in order to add the products into our inventory system. Now with that out of the way, the final function that we need to write is going to be a recipe get function. This is just going to help us with our user interface. Inside this function, let's just return the local recipe array. Now we can switch gears and open up the object inventory. Let's take a look at what we currently have. Inside the create event, instead of creating a new inventory struct, let's change this to be a new recipe struct. This will give us access to all of the original functions and the new functions that we just wrote. This means that everything here and below is still going to continue to work. But first, let's actually add our first recipe. 
We'll start out by calling the recipe add function. The next parameter is going to be the recipe name. Now for the requirements, we're going to pass in an array. This is going to be the requirements for this particular recipe. This array will contain either single or multiple structs. For this recipe, we're going to use a single struct that contains a name, which will be wood, and the quantity of the wood that is required will be one. Now the next parameter is going to be the products. Again, we're going to pass in an array filled with structs. For this name of the product, we'll name it stick, and the quantity is going to be set to two. Finally, we need to pass in a sprite that's going to be used when the item is added into our inventory. The final parameter that we need to pass in is going to be the sprite that's going to be used for the user interface when we're crafting the item. Let's clean this up by lining up the arrays and structs, and now we can copy and paste the recipe below. Let's change the name of this recipe to cooked fish. The requirement is going to be a single fish. And the products that are going to be produced will be a single cooked fish with a quantity of one. Let's make sure we change the sprite to SPR item fish. Now we also need to change the recipe sprite to the item cooked fish. Now, if we take a look at our game, everything works as it did before. What we're actually going to be doing here is we're going to change the stats panel into the recipe panel so that we can craft the items. So back in the IDE, let's switch over to the draw graphical user interface event and let's scroll down to the bottom. Right before the draw reset, let's actually start drawing the recipe panel. Let's create a local variable called recipes and we'll ask the inventory variable to return the recipe array that was created inside of it. Remember, we can do this because we are inheriting both the recipes and the inventory. Next, let's actually start our drawing. Let's create a variable called position X, which will be the UI padding X, which is 64 pixels, plus the UI border size times three. Again, we're also gonna add four to this to keep it in terms of what we had above. Again, if you're not sure what all these values are, you can always reference the previous video in the description. Our UI border size is set to 16, so in the end, our mathematical equation amounts to the X position starting at 116 pixels. Now, before we get too far into it, let's actually scroll up and change the name of the stats panel. All we need to do is in the draw text is change the word stats to recipe. Now we'll scroll all the way back down to the bottom and for the recipes, we're gonna to have to loop through each of the recipes that exist and display them on the screen. We can do this by using a for loop. We'll start at zero until we reach the end of the array for our recipes. We can calculate the Y position of our recipes by using the UI padding and then adding the UI border size multiplied by 13. Now we have to take the recipe index and multiply that by the UI inventory margin plus the inventory box. Again, this seems like a lot of math, but we're just calculating where the Y position needs to start at and it will increase with each recipe. Now that we have our positions, let's actually draw the recipe box by using a draw sprite command. We'll pass in the SPR inventory recipe box sprite and we'll also use the index of zero. For the X and Y, we'll use our position X and position Y variables. Now we need to draw the sprite of the recipe and we'll use the draw sprite command again. We'll access the current recipe by passing in the recipes array, followed by that current index and accessing the sprite within our struct. This will have a subframe of zero because it's not animated and we're gonna be using the position X and Y variables. Now, the reason that we don't need to add anything extra or find the middle is because if we look at the sprites that we imported, such as the cooked fish, you can see that the origin is in the top left. So let's actually run our game right now and see what we have. We currently have a nice recipe box and inside is the recipe or item that will be crafted. So let's actually add some of the text to show what the item is going to be. First, let's align our text to the left by using the draw set h align function. 
And for the draw text function, we want to start at the position X, but add 56 pixels to push it over to the right. For the Y position, we'll add 16 pixels to push it down a little bit. Now we need to access a recipe through the array. We'll also use the recipe index and finally accessing the name parameter. Now to draw the requirements, let's start off by creating a requirement string. This is going to be a placeholder variable that we're going to fill in. Let's loop over the requirements by starting at zero until the selected recipe's requirements array is at the end. Let's increase this loop by one each time. Let's take the requirement string and concatenate onto it. We're going to be using the new string functions in GameMaker to help us do this. We want to prefix our string with a dollar sign, and now within the curly braces, we can access the variables within our current recipe's requirement array. We're going to finalize that by accessing the name of the current requirement. Now we'll add a semicolon onto the string and let's copy and paste what we have and we can just easily change it to the quantity of the item. Finally, we'll add some spacing at the end just to make it look nice. Now outside the for loop, we need to draw the text. Again, we'll be using the draw text command and we'll pass in our position X plus 56 to make it match up with our title. Our Y position will be adding 32 and 16 pixels together. And for the string, again, we're going to prefix it with a dollar sign, allowing us to pass in the parameters. For this particular string, we'll just say REQ, short form for requirements, and then we're going to pass in the requirement string variable. If we run our game now, you can see the title and the requirements, and each recipe should have its own spot here on the left. Next, we need to add the hover effects so that we know that we're hovering over one of the recipes before we select it. Back in the editor, we're going to be using the MX and MY variables. MX is actually set to the mouse X position from a previous video and vice versa. We're going to be checking this to see if it's in between the position X and the position X plus our UI panel left minus 64 pixels. The isBetween function is a script from our previous videos, so if you don't have it, you can just copy and paste it here. Basically, it's just going to check to see if the value that we passed in is in between the minimum and maximum variables returning true or false. Now we can switch back and we can use the same function to check the mouse Y position, which is set to MX. We'll check it to see if it's between the position Y and position Y plus our inventory box. If both of these statements are true, what we're going to do is first change the color by using the draw set command and set the color to the color inventory highlight and the alpha as 0.2. We'll use a draw rectangle function and let's pass in the position X and position Y for the start. And for the final coordinates, we'll pass in the position X plus the Y panel left minus 64. And for the Y position, we'll use position Y plus the UI inventory box. We also need to tell this function that it is not an outlined rectangle, so let's pass in the faults as the final parameter. Finally, we're going to need to reset the draw function calls. We can just call the draw reset command. Now, when we run our game, we can easily hover over these items. However, we cannot click on them yet. So let's switch back to the IDE and add some of the clicking functionality, which will add the crafting. Let's start off by copying everything that we just did in the draw event and switching over to the step event for our object. Here, we're already checking to see if we press the left mouse button, and I've already set up a region for the inventory, so let's scroll all the way down past that region and create a new region for the recipes. Let's paste what we had copied in and clean it up because there's a lot of things that we don't need. First, we'll tab everything to make it look nice and readable, and now we can go through and start removing some of the items. Let's remove all of the draw calls because we don't need them, and we can also remove the requirement string. But we will use the if statements for the hovering. Inside the hover if statements, we'll remove the draw calls as well. So in the end, our function should look something like this. Now, if we've clicked our left mouse button and we are hovering an item, we need to check to see if we have all the requirements for that recipe. So we can easily say if the inventory.recipe has 
and we'll pass in the recipe array, selecting the current index, and then finally passing in the recipe name. If this function returns true, we can just call the inventory.recipeCraft function. And here, once again, we just need to pass in the recipe name. We'll finish everything off. And if we run our game again, let's actually try and make a cooked fish. If we click on the recipe within our inventory, you can see the fish quantity did in fact go down, but we didn't provide the correct sprite for the item. So let's actually switch it back and fix it. Back in the create event, let's find the recipe for cooked fish. And for the cooked fish item, let's change the sprite for the products to be the SPR item fish cooked. Now let's run our game again. So if we come back and we click on the cooked fish, you can see that we now have a new item with the correct sprite within our inventory. Just like before, we're able to use all the inventory items by clicking on them, but now we're actually able to craft on these items depending on what's inside of our inventory. Now, this does bring the inventory system and recipe system to a close. We've added recipes and crafting while inheriting all the functionality from our original inventory system. Going forward, if you'd like to use this in your own games, you're going to have to import both the inventory and recipe script files into your project. I hope you've enjoyed these videos, and if you have any questions or comments, just leave them in the boxes below. Thank you very much for watching the video. It's Mickey, and I hope to see you in the next one.